All right, well, we're going to get started into our lesson, and we've been looking at Matthew chapter 24, 25, and we've been primarily over the last week or so looking at deception. This seems to be something that Jesus talked about, and the New Testament talks about in a great, in, to a great deal, is that uh, part of the last days is going to be deception. We've read that, we know that, but being able to understand the characteristics of it when you encounter it is, is something that is important for us to understand. And Paul uh, really opens some of this up. Jesus said uh, here in Matthew chapter 24 that, uh, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am Christ and will deceive many. That is one of the aspects that, you know, Christ has already come. We know where he is. If you will you know, pay us enough money and become a part of us, we will help you understand where he is. That's one of the deceptions. But as we go into the New Testament, uh, Paul talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, uh, an external holiness that people will in the last days uh, forbid to marry, forbid eating certain fruits and foods and stuff like this under the guise of external holiness. So you have external holiness. And I think it's important because when people look like they really love God, when people look like they are, you know, living for Jesus, it's easy for us to let our guard down and begin to, you know, kind of believe what they have to say about it. Growing up in Pentecostalism, as I did, there were, there were people who looked holy. I mean, no rings, never wore pants, no makeup, you know, long hair up in a bun, and all, you know, go right down the list. They looked but there was something about their attitude. I can remember still, and this is 40, 50 years ago now, a lady who was, she was a big lady. When I say big, she was like 6'1", 6'2", she was a big lady. Getting up in the middle of the service and starting to speak in tongues, supposedly. And she was just like this. And just, you know, people around just, you know, shouting and everything. But she was chewing people out saying things in tongues that she couldn't say in English, you know, but claiming that this was of God. And it's easy to fall for that type of thing and to say, well, I wish I was that spiritual. Well, if you'll do X, Y, and Z, then you will be as spiritual as me, maybe, you know. But that external holiness is a real, it's a real hook to capture and confuse your mind. It's not maybe, yeah, as a believer, as a Christian, it's not gonna cost you your salvation, but it's gonna cost you some confusion and can cost you some difficulty as you live your Christian life. Uh, ever encounter anything like this? Uh, yes, here, years ago. Uh, and, and, and you still remember it. Because, you know, it's, it's it, it's a powerful deception. It's a powerful characteristic. It takes a while for me personally. Once you know you're saved mm -hmm. and you've got that, I don't know, you get braver, after a while you just really don't get braver. It's yeah. what they think. It don't matter what they say. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah, it's and, and that's and that's one of the things that we, we have to get to uh, in our spiritual lives is that, you know, no matter what someone looks like that says, I am better than you because I look better, I act better, I don't do this like you do, I do this like you don't, blah, 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 right on down the line. You have to reach that place. You know, I am a believer. I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I know I'm saved by grace through faith. I am not saved through externals. But sometimes they see when you're on a crypt. Mm -hmm. And they just think something, but everybody's got a bad day. Yeah. 
Yeah. Drive north one day. Let's see what we're Oh, yeah. I'm going to start ordering my coffee from, <laughs> from Black Patterson just so I don't have to drive to Morrisville. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know. The charismatic, it was the theater was during the charismatic. Oh, yeah. Charismatic was. Well, it ain't going away yet. <laughs> Yeah, because generally when you start talking about what you have to have more, journey comes in the line of faith. If you had enough faith, you wouldn't be sick, you wouldn't have accidents, you wouldn't have problems. If you had it, if you, you know, how much is enough? I, you know, I never hear that. But people like that. They, they do. do. Because they're looking for anything, and if someone will tell them, hey, you will have a better life if you'll just follow this little rule, or just mm -hmm. do that. And talk about deception. If you Google or look at the people who claim to be Christ, there's at least ten in the world today. Yeah. And one of them had a group of women that carried him around on a purple chair. You know, purple chair. So people are looking to be deceived, or they're looking for some yeah. kind of guidance in their life. But uh, oh yeah, it's interesting. Just yeah. look. Yeah. You know, it is. Like, yeah. But otherwise, you would have Jim Jones. Right. Uh, because he claimed to be, or David Koresh, yeah. that yeah. they claimed to be Christ, but they had their followers. Mm -hmm. But again, people, because they had a message, they stuck to the message, and people were looking for anything to follow. Yes, and they always look for something that is external. They do not want a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. They'd rather have somebody tell them, do this, this, and this. Well, you, when we was doing his study, uh -huh. we studied the Israelites. And every time somebody went to the mountain to get laws or figure out what we're supposed to do next, they come back two weeks later, and they got golden idols, they're making love with their mama, I mean, it's just the stupidest yeah. thing you ever heard in your life, and it's like, it just never stops. Yeah. It just never stops. We get it, literally, it just, it's in our genes. Yeah. We can't stop. It, and it's called carnality. It's the carnal nature. It's the human carnal nature. We are a fallen people. And as Paul said in Romans 1, you know, we always like to worship the creature rather than the creator. You know, it always comes back to that. that they'll worship the creature. Everything will point to the creator, but they'll worship the creature. They'll, they'll look at it and they'll go up so far, then they'll stop and worship the creature. Because it takes faith and trust and acceptance of what God has said. Yes. It does. It does. And, and, you know, I've been victim of some of, some of that uh, because I didn't fall in line. I was not named from the pulpit, but it was pretty clear who they were talking about who had now apostatized um, solely because I didn't fall in line with everything that was expected of me by this preacher and um, 
So, and it, it is, it's, you know, we look at it and we say, well, that's, that's just a crock. But look at how many people get wound up in the externals because it's something you can see. Oh, yeah. 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 Practiced. Took drama classes on how to, you know. And, uh, and was very successful because that was what that population was geared to. And, and he was very successful. And he said the same thing over and over. He kept saying the same slogan, same thing for years, over and over, until finally people began to believe it. And so it, this, when Jesus talks about deception, it's not just, you know, okay, don't be deceived. Okay, don't be deceived about what? About externals. Uh, don't be deceived about, you know, this goes along with it, a form of godliness. You know, and I look at that as fog, form of godliness, F-O-G, because that's what, it's, what it creates is a fog in people's minds. Paul talks about this in Timothy. He goes down a list in first in first Timothy, second Timothy chapter three, and a list of eighteen things. And one of those things that are listed in that is a, is a form of godliness. And it goes along with this external holiness thing. And this is this is something that we just have to be aware of. You can't talk God's love. And you can't talk, you know, how much you care about the earth and, you know, puppies and elephants and cats and I go right down the line. And then not practice what the Bible talks about as real righteousness, following Jesus Christ. The form of godliness will say, I love everybody. But now you look at the practice. The practice says something else. You talk to them about the practice that the, the Bible talks about, you will find out just how much love they have for everybody. You love everybody, but you don't have to like them. Yeah. You don't have to like what they do. And personalities are different, you know. There's people I have worked with over the years that, you know, I worked with. But we just never said horses, you know. We just, it's just, it was a personality thing. It wasn't, you know, didn't fight or anything, but we just didn't set horses. And we have that. You run into that. But if we have a Christian brother or sister that we just don't set horses with, we still have to always be able that if they need us to be there. That's where the love of God comes in. We, we are, as, as far as the church is concerned, we are our own worst enemy uh, because we have failed as an institution. We have failed to present the gospel of Christ in a way that the world sees what Jesus is truly about. And, and as you go all through history, you'll see how the world has tried to infiltrate and, you know, get involved with church so that it could use the church for their own ends. And then as the church becomes more institutionalized, the more it wants to protect its position in the world and the more it agrees. So that you even have, as in World War II, you had a pope that worked with Hitler, you know. But who is the world? Depending on how you define it. It's Satan. Yeah, everybody that doesn't love Christ, yeah. That's right, it's Satan. So he's trying to Yeah. And 
So we know that he owns the kingdoms of the world. He, mm -hmm. was, he could not have shown pride. Right. All the kingdoms, unless he owned them. So yes, he always tried to uh, get in, manipulate the word, or deceive the believer, and he will continue to do that until God called him out. Yeah. And and the thing that we're running into today, uh, right along that very line, is especially in America, we have, we have developed what is called, what is being called Christian nationalism. Um, it's a very extreme form of conservative politics that connects itself to religion and is very much, if you don't do how I say, you're not a good American, one, and you're probably not a Christian, two. And Satan has taken that. that I was reading an article, so I can't remember the man's name or the new online deal that he has. But he was hacked by the anonymous group and stole, they stole a bunch of information. Anyway, he told his followers he said, now, and this is, this is where it, it, the, the point gets so fine that it's, it, it sneaks in on us. He says, okay, they did all this. Now, I want all of you, his followers, to delete your files as if that's going to hide anything. You know, it's, it's still there. If you send it out, it's still there. And he said, you know, don't do this, don't do that. He said, because our team has prayed a curse on this. And if you don't do it, your files are going to burn. Your computers are going to burn. I read that and I thought, well, why didn't he pray that about the anonymous people and burn it all while it was there? I, you know, but it's that, and I don't know how many people, but it's very closely associated with conservative republicanism, maybe Trumpism, maybe even more extreme than Trumpism, I don't know. I've, that's the first I had heard of that. But it's in those areas where Satan, as the leader of the darkness, the kingdoms of this world in the darkness, he will try to infiltrate and use a form of godliness to deceive. And, you know, Jesus just tells us this to be a, make us, okay, remember this, Christians. This is what you're going to encounter. The world is going to do this. You're going to have people in the church that's going to do this because they're influenced by the world. They're not saved to begin with. And they're going to try to do this. Now, Mm. I mean, because you have people that they need to separate politics from some things that are really far right from Jesus, and they don't have anything to do with each other. Yeah. And yeah, and one of the things I've said for years, y'all heard me say it before, both parties work for the same devil, just in a different way. The it's only... Scary. Yeah. It's, it's, it's different. Now, which party do you want to vote for is fine. That's up to you. But just remember, both of them work for the same devil. Well, they go out, you know. people don't understand, these senators, these big ones, they go out and have drinks together at night and figure out what they're going to do next. Now, there are no cameras there, but if you think Mitch McConnell, or they never go out with each other and figure out what to do, that's just like behind closed doors. Oh, yeah. And it's always been, yeah, and from the founding of the well, nation. Look at their net worth. They make $200,000 for 40 years ago, and they're worth a billion dollars. Yeah. Something don't add to that. Well, Pelosi yeah. has tripled her net worth. She's worth $300 million now. Um, oh, they all, they, yeah, they, but it's just like, don't buy into what is posted because it's really not true. But then you have somebody take the bait, and you're like, Yeah. What's wrong with these people? 
and Paul, Paul t- tells us about this because he talks about how do we handle some of the end time junk that we run into. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, now, brothers, about the time and dates, we do not need to write you the day of the Lord. He's, that's what he introduces it with. And he goes down through verse 11, and he gives us a series of things that we need to remember to, to help us to be able to respond to these deceptions. And he says, first, you're all sons of the light. He said, you're not in darkness, so that this day should just surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So don't be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. So one of the first things is that we need to remember the book is the answer. We need to keep our minds in the book. We can, we can, you know, I'm not telling you not to be on social media. I'm not, but you know, that doesn't make me, that doesn't make me any holier than anybody else. But people on social media, guess what they're telling me now? Huh? Guess what they're telling me on social media now? What? The Catholic Church gave us this book and they made it up. Oh yeah. That's all over. That's all over. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, so if you want to deal with all that on social media, you, you go after it. You just swipe. But you need, yeah. <laughs> But you need to be grounded in the word that gives you the light, not the darkness that gives you the light so that we might understand what we encounter. Because you run into it every day on your job. You run into it every day. You need to read what they're saying so you can go back to the book, get your evidence. So whenever they bring it up, well, the Catholic Church made the Bible. Whoa, whoa, let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah, no. We have to watch, too. It's not just like the Catholic Church, and I'll tell you why real quick. When it came time for the election, and it wasn't anybody in here, I don't think. I literally had a teacher from one of our local schools ask me in the parking lot of the food pantry, and this question just blew me away. You know, I mean, I told you before, if I thought she would go to hell because she voted Democrat for, for Governor Cooper. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> We had we had a we had a couple that visited our class. I don't know if you remember them. I can't recall their names, but this was back when we were in the downstairs in the room down there. And a young couple, I say young. Everybody's young to me now, but uh, uh, 35 maybe 30 35. And. And son, he he was he was a he was a Republican. I mean, not not slamming him. He, you know, he would be very upfront to tell you that. And he actually, we were in some kind of discussion similar to what we have now. And at the end of the class, he told me he said, he said, I don't think anybody could even be a Christian and be a and be a Democrat. Uh, and what was his name? I don't I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, but uh, you know, but it's it's that thing that you know you either follow this or else, and it's not like that when you have both parties working for the same devil. Uh, you know. Well, I, I, I agree with that at some point, but you got you know I don't like the whole Republican Democrat because it puts people in battles. Yeah. You know that 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 whole that's polarizing and separates people. When it comes down, you got whoever. Oh yeah. If, yeah. You, if you if you believe this and read this, mm-hmm. you have a real difficult time checking the box. Yeah. Let's kill these children. Let's teach them. Let's do all these. In 
and that's that's what yeah that's what you have to look at you look at it in light of scripture you do you that's how I got you. Yeah. That scripture guiding you towards one side of saying, let's kill children, let's do this. Let's do all these things. Let's limit church and right to do this. Let's take away their tax exemption. Let's do that. You think the Bible's going to lead you to that side? I, I don't know. Sure. Well, it it's it's not abortion anymore, man. When they're born oh, yeah, and exactly. they screw up an abortion, they can kill the baby on the table. Yeah. As a, that's murder. Yeah, that's who not who is it? The governor of New York said, How did, what, that's is, what is life? You know, because they had messed up an abortion, the baby was born, and she said, kill it. You know, and they were questioning, so it goes into the semantics thing. Well, how do you, what is life? How, what, what do you mean by life? The kids living and breathing, that's life, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, but that's where, you know, you get into this, you're, you're sons of the light, sons of the day. We have the illumination of the Holy Spirit, First John chapter 2. As believers, we have this. This is what we fall back on. Because we do, it is confusing. Both sides work for the same devil. Which side works in a way that you don't agree with in Scripture the most? Okay, then you want to vote for, you know, whatever party. But at the same time, we have to keep in our minds that all of them, all of the rulers of the darkness of this world are working for the devil. We just have to keep that in mind. And whenever, whichever party we voted for, whenever we cross their line in our belief system, they're going to attack us just as quickly as the other side would do. There's a saying. Huh? You trust everybody, but you blame Jesus. You listen to the <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> and you brand your cattle, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's what we have to do. It's always a juggling match when you deal with the world. How do we deal with it? We're sons of light. Get into the Word. Learn and have that Word fill in your heart and your mind rather than science, education, you know, society, sociology, whatever. Let the Word ground you. And Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. And this is, you know, it ought to be highlighted everywhere. Keep your head in all situations. Now, how relevant is that? He said, keep your head in all situations. Now, let me ask you a question. What does that, what does that say to you? When, when you, when I say that, quote that scripture, 2 Timothy 4, 5. Keep your head in all situations. When you show yourself, sometimes you're not composed. And you say things you shouldn't be saying. So just keep your mouth shut and learn from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's what Brad said a while ago, as long as you get older. I truly think that's something you go through stages. Because, you know, if you're a Christian, in your 30s, you know, you know you're right and you argue about it. Because you know you're right. You know, I'm a very right and wrong person. You're the right or wrong. Because the Bible says, but then you try to argue about it. Then you realize you can't fix stupid. Yep. Then you go through, but then you do, I think, get to the point where you're like, in my head, I see this little bit of a ripple off, and I'm like, mm -hmm. just stay in your lane right now. Yeah. It's not worth it. But I do think it's like these stages of Christian. Yeah. And, and Paul, Paul said this, and this is what he's saying. He said, learn, keep your mouth shut, but keep your head. Don't allow your mind to become confused, distraught, overcome. Keep your head in all situations, in conversation, in emails. I mean, I can remember the day things happened. There I go, you know. My and was really good at it. He was his own Sunday school teacher. And I went, used to do his old man's class, but I went, I was younger. And this guy said something, and it was totally left field, like abortion or something like that. My grandfather didn't say that. And I couldn't believe it, because I was one of the attack. <laughs> so what is it? He goes to Scripture. And the next week, he's got his ear tapped. He said, guys, we're going to get away from Scripture today. And not Scripture, we're going to get away from the lesson. He said, I didn't even talk about what was said last week. And for 35 minutes, he talked. And when he got done, he got apologized to mm -hmm. That's how you do it. Yeah. You that's get, that's you keeping your head. You read your book, yeah. you earmark, and you prove it's wrong. Or at least give him a different thought on his mouth. Yeah. 
Any more growth? Yeah, and you have to you have to gauge the timing, how you do it, when you do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are times. Yeah, there are times. Or you do like I do when you write out the text to respond, and then you go and you delete it. Yeah. And you're just like let it go, and let it go. Yeah, yeah. There, 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 there was <laughs> there was there was a time here a while back when I was working in one of the jobs that I had, that a person wrote to me and my, uh, a supervisor wrote to me and alleged that I was not dedicated to my job. Now, <clears throat> uh, not to brag or anything, but I traveled probably more than most every other person in that group. And was always, if they didn't have somebody to fill in, I'd go. Bob, 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 call me in the early. One called me when I had one person call me at four o'clock in the morning. Can you come fill in for me today? You know, all this. So I just get hot and I fire off and ended up having to have a meeting, which supervisor wanted to have the HR person there they really wanted me to be written up or fired over this and and part of it was I lost my head in this and we have to be able to keep our heads whether you're emailing whether you're texting whether you're on Facebook whether you're on Instagram or, or whatever you're, you you do be wise as a believer be wise as a Christian you know, keep your head. You don't have to prove you are right. The proof is in the gospel. That's what you present. The gospel is what's right. We may be kind of two steps to the left or to the right of what the real intent message is. So we're not trying to prove ourselves. But that's where we get into trouble when we, you know, bless God, I'm going to show them that I'm right. Keep your head in well, all situations. Guys, you and the other Christian are both okay. You just have a different relationship. I know what you're going through, but there are other people on the outside and that you don't even know who they are that are watching you guys' responses mm -hmm. and comments. You two, if me and you got an argument, we might write that email back and we, we're going to be okay because we're going to be ourselves at the end of the day. We still love Jesus. One of us is probably right, one of us is wrong, probably have to. And, and Paul says in this same section, he says, you know, he says, be alert, self-control, as he says in 2 Timothy 4, 5, keep your head. But then he says to put on faith and love as a breastplate. Now, you know, when Paul goes down this list, he's not just saying things so that we'll get this, you know, uh, comic picture, you know, in our minds. But in the midst of all the confusion, to really have faith and trust in God, to be grounded in Him, and love for Him, firstly, and then for each other. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. He's talking about among Christians. He's not saying go out here and just tell some evil, Oh, I just love you and mm, accept you for who you are. No, I do not. I cannot. Now, I'd love for you to get saved. Then I can love you as a brother or sister in Christ. But for us as believers, this should mark us out. One of the great things you as a class did for us while I was going through my sickness, was all the text calls, the food, the, the, you know, the cards, the, all that you did. That strengthened and helped us in ways that you probably will never know. God will know because you, have, you act in a way that will be remembered when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
I'm sure it will. Because it was a blessing and a strength to us. And, you know, that faith and love, that's what should designate us. When people come into our body as believers and they're not saved, one of the things that should impress them is our relationship with each other as believers. But here again, here's where we are most of the time our own worst enemy. Uh, as I told you about the, the Pentecostal guy down in South Carolina who was going to shoot the preacher over the color of the carpet in the church. Had him in his crosshairs. And his gun misfired. That's the only thing saved a man's life, but it was the grace of God. You know, the color of the carpet, we really? We got one has got three or four colors in it. I mean, you know, take it. <laughs> I, but this is what Paul said. You know, this is what we got to put on in the midst of the last days, and put on hel the, the helmet of salvation. You know, and this is not just looking back. So, oh, yeah, I, I remember when I was about ten years old, I came down. And I really got saved. No, this is looking forward. You got saved. What did that do t for you? It gave you the promise of an inheritance to come. We look forward based upon our salvation. We got saved. We accepted Jesus. He redeemed us, forgave us, made us eternally secure, which gives to us the promise of an inheritance. So as you face all that we're going to face, and we're not facing nothing yet as to what we are going to face. And we just need to be ready because as we begin to lose the things that we have here, we need to keep our minds set on what we have to come. That's the helmet. That's what helps protect the head, you know. And then he, he Paul says, and encourage. Verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. We ground ourselves in the word. We look to Jesus Christ. We love the fellowship of each other. And we encourage and strengthen each other. We don't do this much anymore. We're, we, we, as a society, we're very individualistic. And as individuals, we, we don't tend to be collectively involved. Uh, and I'm not saying it's wrong, it's just kind of how our society has been in America. But one of the things that Paul says we need is to encourage each other and build each other up. You never know what somebody in this room is going through or is about to go through. You don't know. What about neighbors? Yeah. Yeah. And it just weighs on. Yeah. We don't, and we need to do that. And one thing, it's the thing as well, kind of, I was amazed. I had to brag on that. Even at our church last night, there were 35 or 40 men wow. on a Saturday night. Of course, they got Brad's steaks, which is really great. Well, that's enough to bring the whole community right there. I mean, yeah. But Not a Bud Light among them, huh? Not, not one, not one in the place. It's got no light. Oh, wait, well. It's in the car, but not in the church. But yeah. the thing is, that's, that the thing is, is that we have to, like, yeah, go out and do that. Because I know Matt's really, look, we're very blessed to have a preacher that's very aware of that now. But that was a miracle to have that yeah. many men on Saturday night at 6 o'clock do that. Yeah. And so those are the kind of things that just makes you, um, and you know when something's right, it's just right. And those are the kind of things, I think, especially now, that churches need to do. Yeah, and we're, we're, as we move further into the end times, the intensity of the end times, and we are going to go there. You're not going to stop it. We're going to need that more and more. But we're going to be the rapture. 
Yeah, you are. But after it's over. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that briefly in Matthew chapter 24 because he talks about, you know, a gathering. Yeah, yeah, he talks about that in verse 31 of chapter 24. Uh, yeah. Don't anybody tell me what I said what he was Yeah. I said I was leaning your way there. The truth will set you free, brother. <laughs> I would, the more I see what's coming, the more I wish I was wrong. <laughs> that well, I think he wants some of us to stick around and not give them our guns, just give them the bullets. So I think yeah, I understand that. Yeah, yeah. And that may well come to some of that, yeah. Oh, you're here for guns? I'm just seeing Yeah. Yeah, like I, like I got a neighbor that had, he, I don't think he has a flag up now, but he had a flag with AR-15 on it. He said, come and take it. You know, uh, and when if they decide to come and take it, they will. Um, they better come from the air. Yeah, they will. <laughs> I mean, and they will. yeah, and they will. So, and I think I spent a lot of time on this because I think when Jesus starts off with this point, and it's Paul starts off in several sections and talking about the end time deception. Uh, it's, it's a big deal, and it comes at us in so many varied ways. But, and I know I don't have a whole lot of time, but the next, second and third thing that Jesus talks about that is going to make up the end times is that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So what we are seeing in our society, you know, almost every day, there's some county or some state that wants to succeed, you know. Um, or we have some state like the Marxist state of California or the anarchist cities of Portland and Seattle that we are, we are seeing almost virtual civil war even in our own country. I can remember a friend of mine who has passed on, he told me in the 80s in his, some of his journeys in South Carolina at that time that he had ran into some people that had bazookas and so forth and asked them, why, why did you want a bazooka? I mean, you know, he said, for the revolution. So, it's been building. We are seeing a, a convergence of differing ideas. One side is what, if you want to call it the woke or whatever. And the other side is idiot, <laughs> sleep, whatever. That's whatever. We're seeing a convergence of these things that have been building for years in our country. There's articles from the mid-1950s advocating pedophilia, the acceptance of pedophilia. So this has been something that's been underneath the surface for years that has finally reached a place to where it has, you know, broken out. And against that, you have people who don't believe those things. Rightly so. And we're seeing a convergence to where some form of civil war is happening in some areas of our nation. And it's not black and white. No, huh? At all. No, no, it's not not at not at all. It's pretty much a Christian versus non Christian or, or some form of religion versus non form of religion. Some some definition of conservatism versus a definition of Liberalism, I, you know, to put it the broadest way. And Jesus said that you're going to see these things. These things are going to happen. China's threatening the whole world, you know. Uh, Russia, never know what they're going to do. They're already trying to put Europe in a deep freeze by cutting off the gas to, their, to, the, to the nations and blah, blah. You hear all this. But the interesting thing about it, and I'll wrap up with this, Jesus says, don't be alarmed. See to it that you are not alarmed. 
Now, really? Don't be alarmed. When should we become alarmed, Lord? You know. We got people that are killing people just because. That's been going on since the end of Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But the, in, the intensity of it is becoming such that it is, it is dangerous to go to the supermarket. It is dangerous to go on a trip somewhere. It's, you used to know. You want to go somewhere, take off. Someone pull up on the side of the road, you're having a problem. Yeah. You used to hitchhike. I remember hitchhiking. That's the only way we had to go for a period of years in, in my life was thumb it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> way, way before the Amish, you know. And, uh, but that sense of respect, that sense of decency, all of that trust, just general common sense decency is gone. Some kid shot a Marine in Times Square, shot him in the back just because he wanted to shoot him. They didn't even know each other, shot him in the back, killed him. The guy jogging out in Oklahoma, two teenagers, or two or three of them, shot him just, they shot him just because they thought it was cute to do it, killed him. We're seeing all this, Jesus says, don't be alarmed. We'll talk about what he means by that next week. Thank you. Great conversation, y'all. Great.